be focused. This talk's going to mostly just be follow, about following and trusting your intuition, which is what I um, feel like most of my work has come about and through is just by me following my intuition. So when I look back on all my art I've created, this is the major thread. And possibly this is because I never had a mentor in photography. So I forged my own style, look, and way of creating by trusting my instincts. Hey, it's not forwarding. Come on. Uh, who am I? I'm going to give you a really quick rundown about who I am so you can understand me better and where my art comes from. First of all, I'm purely an artist and I only make art really for myself. Um, I am an empath and I'm also an animal trainer and lover. Uh, this is me sitting <laughs> with my first dog, Jacques. I trained my first dog when I was 10. My father, uh, he pushed me to be the person, whoever the person is I wanted to be, he didn't, he didn't push me to be anything but who I was. And he always said I was, I was different. And so he kind of just let me go on my own route. Um, he also had two girls and he raised us very much like boys. Um, this is my dad. Um, that's me, little me and my older sister, Molly. And my dad helped me to sew. He helped me draw and he gave me a love for nature and land, and I wanted to go everywhere with him. Um, he also was very organized, honest, grounded, and he used the F word all the time. And if you know me well, you know that I also use that word probably too much. Uh, he was from Texas and he rode Broncos. He was also a geologist and a civil engineer. My dad let me use his Polaroid and bought me my first camera when I was seven. This is my mom. Um, <laughs> I mostly photographed all my animals when I got that camera and I started documenting my friends as I moved into junior high. It didn't take me long to realize my first camera wasn't giving me what I wanted. I did get a higher end point and shoot that I used until I bought my first real SLR at 17 and took my first community course on how to use it. This is Ginger. Her taste for quality and style definitely influenced me as a child, keeping things clean and orderly and making a home with a finished look and style was important to her. And she definitely influenced me in her style, work and way of living. And that's me with matching checkered pants. Where am I from? I'm from Eastern Washington State. This is the landscape out there. Um, this is on the other side of Seattle. So the rain hits the mountains in Seattle and rains, and then it leaves Eastern Washington state as a desert step land. I lived near the Columbia River that runs north to south until it turns west and goes down the Washington, Oregon border to the Pacific. And that's the little area I grew up in. I lived in an area called the Tri-Cities Richland Pasco Kennewick. This is where the United States government made plutonium for the Manhattan Project. And this is the Hanford nuclear site. Both my grandfathers worked at Hanford. This is my mom's mom, my grandma Ruby. She was a seamstress. I also realized I was good at sewing and designing and probably got all that from her. I start, started altering my clothes when I was 12 and went on to make Halloween costumes and prom dresses. I most definitely got my style and taste also from her. And I really thought uh, sewing and designing clothes was my first art. And I didn't look at photography at this time as my art or even realize that you could be a photographer and make a living. My granddad, Willie, um, here on the right, he was one of the first surveyors who came out to build the first nuclear plant. Um, they came out from Missouri. This is my dad's side of the family. This is Lulabelle, Sarah, and Dusty Rhodes. This is my dad, uh, and my dad's sister in the middle. My grandpa, Dusty, worked as a physicist for DuPont and was brought out to work at, Han at the Hanford plant, mostly as a chemist. 
Dusty and Lou retired and started making jewelry using agates, jade, and semi-precious stones. So I got a lot of I got a lot of art and style in my family. So the other thing I want you to understand about me is my influences because I really didn't have a mentor. So fashion artists and film uh, influenced my art just to help you see what influenced me outside of my family. You know, all these artists inspired me and I was set up through them visually for what is possible when you let yourself play and create. As a kid in a government town, I mostly followed the art of fashion photographers. I had my own checkbook by age 12. I processed my own film and also purchased a subscription to Vogue magazine, which still comes to my house today. Helmut Newton, one of my favorite fashion photographers, I felt he always took risks in his imagery and, they, and that it also went beyond fashion into art. In college, in the art department, I created my own major in fiber and fabrics because I thought I was going to be a clothing designer. One of my favorite artists I discovered on my own, who is not in the canon, is Egon Schiele. His work is intimate and personal, and his lines and style show feeling and emotions that moved me. I took my first black and white photography class on processing and printing and started shooting medium format. I discovered Frida Kahlo and she taught me about self portraiture and art through her own personal pain and suffering, showing me it is okay to create through emotions and your heart. I looked at Man Ray and all the experimental and non traditional imagery he made by playing with chemicals in the dark room. I'm pretty much a self taught photographer and only took the two classes on processing and developing black and white film in college. I was motivated, motivated by Dusha, Marcel Duchamp, object as art to see differently. It really changed my way of looking at art when I um, discovered him. Andy Warhol, taking objects that resonate with culture, life, and society. Jacques Sturgis, I was obsessed with his portraiture and the controversy around his work. Jan Sadek for his surreal, rebellious, experimental, hand-painted and double exposure imagery. He was a Czechoslovakian artist. And Nan Golden with her personal immersion into a scene, the imperfect grungy documentary images and tungsten lighting really resonated for me. This gave me the freedom that images don't have to be perfect if they have story and energy behind them. Dwayne Michaels, and though I didn't see his work until after I was writing on my own images, I did fall in love with the hand of the creator mixed with imagery. And again, the imperfect, imperfect uh, scribbles and photos as a single one of one piece of art. I find that text added to images brings personal energy onto the page. I watched a movie by Peter Greenway in my 20s called The Pillow Book, and this was my link to the love of text. And the film Breaking the Waves by Lars Van Trier with his female emotions and st stunning cinematography. Be prepared for an intense emotional journey if you watch this film. All these artists were my mentors and I visually took them in to my psyche. Aha moment number one. I had a big aha moment in college when I realized I learned through touching, watching, doing. I set the curve on a test in a textile class looking at fibers under a microscope and I suddenly realized my superpower. This blew my mind and changed how I saw and understood myself. Seeing that no one else realized this, as usual, I was on my own to figure out how to survive in a world that didn't cater to this style of learning. Ten short stories. This is the first um, body of work I put together and, and as a show. I was shooting objects and printing in my small dark room at this time. I started making paper negatives and typing poetry over top of the images. 
This work is about my relationship with my musician and heroin addict boyfriend at the time. How cliche, I know, because I'm from Seattle. I was working at a studio binding books for a living and also started my first business, Trike Works, making high-end craft, craft items for museums, stores, and the such. This work is based in my personal struggles with life at the time, obviously. I was also building work around what I had access to. My dark room could only print eight by 10 or smaller, so the images are five by seven, and I mounted them on aluminum, and then I forced patina. This show was hard to write about, and I had to really push myself to understand why I made the work. And because I didn't come from the academic school of photography, I was making it up and learning on the go. I learned a lot curating my first show in a coffee shop. So this is actually how the, the, the work showed. This is the series as a whole. Each five by seven piece hung from three nooses. Uh, they're set up. Uh, by hanging the work this way, I was able to weave all the pieces together to make one large story. The nooses were structurally and conceptually part of the art, but also practical in helping even out all the pieces so they would hang at the same level. The images were deconstructed in a way that shows my feelings at the time. Loss of detail, typed on, covered in matte medium, patina, and hanging from nooses. At this time, I also had no skills in speaking about my emotions, and they were pretty much pouring out through my art. This work showed in a handful of coffee shops. Portraits. I consider myself a portrait photographer, and when I realized that, my work opened up as a commercial and editorial photographer, but I was mainly working in the music industry in Seattle during the 90s. I had a show called Alone, images of people and objects and places. These things all conveyed the same feeling. And this is just a few of those images. I was often shooting self-portrait images when I had an idea or the light or the location was interesting or cool. I used myself because it was easier than working with a model. I was very spontaneous and loved the lack of control when you shoot on a timer. As I got into the music scene more, I started shooting more portraits for album art, promos, and friends for fun. I was shooting on my Hasselblad or my twin lens Rolly Flex. I also was often the stylist and producer of these small jobs. By doing all these small shoots over time, I became a better director and later actually started shooting and directing videos. I shot this image in the gallery space where I had a show of handmade rose wallpaper. I was not always making art that was easily sold, but I was following my instincts to make something and finished by having a show wherever that might be. I styled this image of my friend, Rosie Thomas, a musician. I later sold some of the images to Sub Pop to use on her album. I really had no connections to fancy galleries, but worked with many small startup spaces looking to fill walls. I started shooting for Rocker Girl magazine and was able to focus on women in the scene, which was right up my alley because I love to support other women. This is my friend, Dave Bazan from Pedro the Lion. I also shot his wedding. I was pretty much the rock and roll wedding photographer in town. 28, this is a body of self-portrait work that was inspired by my crazy bedspread, my headboard, and my vintage girdle. You'll see the influences from the movie Pillow, Pillow Book. So this is 28 as a whole. 28 was a spontaneous idea, but the first time I shot it on my Yushika point and shoot, I didn't know how, it, I didn't like how it looked, but it helped me see how to shoot it again. The second time I shot it, I didn't know it, but I was pregnant at the time. The serendipity of the time I shot it and later a poem that emerged brought this whole piece together. After shooting the work, I went home at Christmas time like a couple months later, and I had a massive fight with my mother, and I wrote the poem that is written onto each image. There's 28 images, 28 lines in the poem, and I was 28 years old. This image right here 
is, and she reminds me I'm 28. The fight was about not living a normal life she could understand, not having a normal job, not having a husband, not having kids, and I was 28. This piece is called, And My Body Wants to Drive Away. I taught myself how to print color, and my boyfriend at the time was opening a restaurant in Vancouver, BC. So I would drive up to visit and print at a lab because the dollar was so high, it was like 40% off compared to printing in the States. This one's called, but it's Christmas day and I'm far from safe. Whoops, I skipped one. I don't know how to go backwards. Um, Anyways, this is the next one, 1B, Opening the Door. This simple single shot idea turned into a book. This was a spark of an idea followed by letting go and letting flow. So the first page of the book is the box and that's it on the right. The idea was to have an image of a woman being lit from the light of the fridge. This vision came from a fashion magazine and I came home late one night and decided to shoot it. Page two is the girl, page three is the opening. My white shepherd pony kept getting up each time I would go to reset the timer on my old AE-1 Canon camera. It was set up on a tripod the visitor, the question. Later, after looking at the contact sheet, I felt like I had a story about a conversation <laughs> that we were having. This conversation goes both ways, me speaking to her and her speaking to me. What are you searching for? Happiness. I only made two books. One was a proof. Each were 11 by 14 hard board with printed black and white images adhered with PVA book glue. I sold this at an auction. What I love is the idea of not controlling the situation, experimenting and letting my dog walk into the frames and then creating something bigger when I sat down to really understand what I had. This work actually has handwritten text on the sides of the paper. So on this last one, I, I put it on the side. It says the, the search. Um, and so it also had handwriting. Ruby and Willie. This is another experience that was rooted in letting it happen and then building on it. This was an exploration of the mundane, my grandparents' house. This series came from curiosity and play, making images for myself because of a love for my grandfather and this home. I shot a handful of images around the house before my mother yelled at me to come downstairs, hang out with my grandpa and watch football. I went home after Christmas and processed the film and from a small amount of images I shot that night, I knew I had to go back. My instinct said, you must document the whole house. Taking photos of a time and a place before it is gone. I went down the next month and my granddad had already fallen and was in a home healing. He never went back to this house, and months later, the house was cleared out and sold. So I had a handful of shows with this work, and I also made a book, my first real book. This was all pre-online making books. Plus, this was all shot on film, and I couldn't afford to print color. So I bought my first nice printer to make this work at home and borrowed a scanner from someone to scan and build this show. The scanning prepared me for the book. It took me four years to process, edit, print, and show this work. Thankfully, inkjet printers were a new thing. Remember, no one was teaching Photoshop or scanning or printing digitally at this time. So again, this was all self-taught. I sold 
single images, but also sold this as a full collection later, seven across, making the boxed collection a 202. Visitor, rebuilding the family album. I had moved to Los Angeles, but was traveling to work in Seattle. This series was created after I had my son and I was itching to make art after years of commercial work. I took a class with Aline Smithson to jumpstart me into art again. She asked for a self-portrait. This is the image I made for the class. I had been thinking about how to use the vintage snapshots from my mother's side of the family and all my vintage clothes that I collected. So I was ready to build this work and my husband taught me some Photoshop tricks. So that's my shepherd mouse and me with my grandma Ruby, 1936. Everything was print, uh, primed and ready as I had a box of old photos and had wanted to use them for a project. So that's me up in the far left-hand corner holding my son. And this is the image of my mom with her aunt and uncles and my grandpa. Each image is as close to the original size of the snapshot and they were each floated in a shadow box, 14 by 14 inches. And then I hand wrote on the map board before I framed it in white ink. And a lot of the clothing and stuff I'm wearing is from my grandma's house. That dress I have on was my grandmother Ruby's and the earrings I have on were my mom's. When I looked back at the work and needed to write about it, I found that I was really trying, uh, I found that I was really trying to understand my mother and my relationship with her. Our DNA and how we are created through time by all these people in our lives. Their experiences affect us as children and we pass on the ancestral trauma and worry. Then we have to grow up and untangle the mess to get back to who we really are. The series is about rebuilding the family that I felt unconnected to and rewriting the past, understanding my mother and not passing trauma down to my son. So that's my son in the shot and just my hand is barely showing there. My mom and my great grandma, Maud. I ended up showing the work in a timeline form. The black painted strip on the bottom you see there has handwritten dates. And then I have a tiny white line that runs up from the timeline to the piece of art. My goal is still to build out my father's side of the family and possibly move into color images. So I do hope to revisit my father's DNA and also the history of candid images across decades using multiple types of cameras. Declassified, Hanford, a secret place. When I started shooting the landscapes in landscape in Eastern Washington, where I'm from, I didn't know what its purpose was. I just knew I had to document this area that I had hated for so long that now I was able to see as beautiful. I consider these portraits of the land more than landscapes. This image was shot first in 2004 and I kept being called to shoot the land again, but it took me in, until 2013 to really dive in and start shooting. This area has so much classified information about it. Most people have no idea what happened here. And you will learn more. This is a secret land full of beauty, but it has nuclear waste buried underground. This is the Columbia River. It's the last 50 miles of untouched wild river flowing in the United States. Because the government owned this land, they never put a dam right here. And you're looking across the Columbia River and there's some tiny little houses and those are um, the facilities now covered, cocooned in cement that made plutonium. This work is dedicated to the resilience of nature, even in the destruction of man. 
If we just leave mother nature alone, she will find beauty again. This work will pop up again later within new work. So I never, I never really showed this work, but I did have it all scanned and um, it was all shot on, I think I shot it all on my Rolly Flex. So it's also film. This is just a collection showing you the collection. Treasures, objects I've known all my life. I used photography to capture a time and a place which gives a sense of comfort. Because of my camera, I'm never alone. My work speaks for me. It tells the truth that I cannot. Washcloth. My dad got this as a bachelor in the 1960s. It lives under the sink at my mother's house. My parents are divorced. This was my first presentation of this work. I'll show you more. I just want you to see uh, kind of how it was presented. I made three boxes total of 44 cards each. I was 44 years old at the time I made this. They're five by seven in size and later it becomes a book. So I'm showing you them in five by seven card form. I started creating this body of work when I just discovered this scrubby there on the left in a drawer at my mom's house. I said to myself, I have known that scrubby my whole life. And in that moment, I started documenting the objects at my mother's house that I had known my whole life. Tupperware bowl purchased at a Tupperware party, 1954. Nail file, 1950s diamond dead nail file. It was my grandmother Ruby's, now it's my mom's. I often have feelings and emotions when I shoot objects and I wanna tell their story. Each object has a place in our lives and a story to tell. And I feel in a Marie Kondo kind of way, I'm paying my respects by photographing them before they are let go. Initially, I thought treasures was about my mother and how I felt as if she treasured her things more than she treasured me. But I realize now that this work is not about me being less important, but instead about my fears, fears of not only becoming her, but also of the, but also of affecting my son through the lessons I learned from her. I use my work to uncover the secrets kept deep inside and through my photos, I have to dig deep to understand why I've created the imagery. This is how, if, if I show the work, um, which I never showed treasures as a, like on the walls, but it's been in a few shows and I show it like this. It's, um, it's a collection of images, 24 by 24 inch paper. This is the book. Um, it's a postcard book and I self-published it. So the little stories for each um, on the postcard are on the back of each postcard. It gives you the little story. So coasters, a wedding gift for, to my parents, no watermarks since 1965 and scrubby from 1975. My mom still uses it to clean vegetables. Aha moment number two, I realized all my work thus far is under one umbrella. This changes how I look at my work as a whole. Family, place, memory, and identity all wrapped up in personal discovery and all under one umbrella. Without words, grounded in nature. Uh, this is a pivot away from family, but still follows me through emotions and self-realization. When I cannot speak, photography is my voice. When I started without words, it was rooted in play and I was in a place of beauty and had time. What I didn't realize until months later was the work was showing me a deeply sad and depressed person. This all came after a handful of close and important friends passed away within a few years. I was creating work to show others how I felt and that these feelings are universal. So you are not alone if you feel this way. Over time while shooting, I started to feel better and used nature to heal myself and the work shifted to having a light and a dark side. 
when I am grounded, when I ground myself to the earth, I am able to see I am not stuck in the mud. I need the mud to survive. So they kind of have a yin and yang on each. I'm reminded that we all come from the same biology and we are all equal, no better than any animal, insect, plant, or tree. It is nature that will bring us back to the connectivity of all matter on earth. And it is in this, in my humble respect, we must find in order to ensure the survival of us all. So some of the images I played with this stacking method that I came up with. Um, and you will, I actually came up with it on another project called Contaminated, um, which I'll show you in a minute. With these photographs, I hope to bring our eyes to the truth and beauty of the world surrounding us during our darkest and happiest moments. I want to transcend from paper to feel. So um, here's the work at Building Bridges Art Exchange in Santa Monica, California. I brought the nest I made during the lockdown. So I, um, I also made the nest that was in the image um, that I just showed. Oh, there it is, it's in the background. The nest image and most of the images have a lonely feeling to them, but with nature, we can find our way home. Without words are my innermost thoughts come to life, meaning that I can only understand after the fact. What might have started as a despair now represents hope. What might have been negative now with the lessons learned, it seems are positive. Inside each image is rebirth. Inside each image is an untangled string and a riddle solved. These are photographs that represent a journey of letting go and starting anew without words. So from the beginning, I really never wanted to explain my work. I wanted people to feel and relate on a deeper level than just viewing a pretty picture. But over time, I've learned to write about my art. And by doing so, I've discovered much about myself. For me, the photos I make come to me subconsciously and tell the truth that I can often not say with words. This whole series started with play, but also with visions and feelings that I have for a location. I often can see the image in a location and or I have a vision and then I wait till I find the right location to shoot it. When I hung the show, I needed the images to be able to connect to one another. So I decided not to have any mat and the natural walnut frames also speak to the environment, which I'm also painting as a portrait. This is a view of this image, it's called Denton House. It's framed um, in the walnut the same, but I'm showing you the stacked, um, if you look at the leaves right by her face, they're stacked up and they make a shadow on her. Um, you can see the shadow over her face from the leaves. These are one of one collector images. So I, I don't do them on all of them, but I did them on a few that it worked on. I had a show at the lodge here in LA and <clears throat> I pretty much curated the whole thing, showed it, advertised it, did everything. And then here's another collection. I often love showing my work in, as bigger pieces in collections. This is uh, Contaminated Government Fallout. Contaminated is a layered historical ex exploration of the people affected by the secrets that were kept by the United States government during the Manhattan Project, their subsequent illnesses and the polluted land. So I'm still working on this. As you can see, I'm returning to declassified images and they're having a rebirth inside of contaminated. This is Washington state where I'm from again. You're looking at the reactors across the river and Saddle Mountain in the background. This geographic area has not been changed by man since the last ice age over 10,000 years ago. The Columbia River, as I said, it's the last 50 miles of wild river. So. So, and though the government was there trashing the land in one way, they also preserved the land in another way. 
And then I just gave you a little map so you could understand where the um, where all this is in that little red circle. This is the front page of the Richland Villager paper, August 6, 1945, the day that the local people working out at Hanford realized what they had been involved with, the day we dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and 9th. This would change history. As you can see, uh, this is a sculpture and um, I, I had a vision for this because uh, my grandfather had thyroid cancer and I wanted to burn a hole through the photo and the stacking represents like all the layers of people that have the same problem, all the layers in the land that is damaged. So it's just the multiples of everything and all the problems. Um, Let's see, this is my grandfather, Dusty. He's my dad's dad. He worked for DuPont as a chemist, and was brought out to Hanford in 1944 to work at the Hanford Works. He's one of the few people that knew what was going on at Hanford because everybody was separated. Nobody knew what anybody was working on. He lived to be 80 years old and had thyroid and stomach cancer, both of which are on the list for the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act. Many years after his death, when the Compensation Act became available, we encouraged my dad to apply for survivor's benefits. My father and his sister were compensated in a lump sum payment of $150,000 for my grandfather's illnesses, which were caused by working at the Hanford area. So this is, I made a little uh, newspaper um, to go with the show. Contaminated is the story of what happened in southeastern Washington state. This is where I was born. This is where my family lives. In 1942, my grandfather, Willie Warford, became the first surveyor on the site for the U.S. government Hanford Engineer Works. The Hanford Nuclear Reservation was tasked with processing plutonium for the first atomic bombs. So on the left there, on the back of the flyer I made um, is all the different places that count as things that might have been caused by living in the area or working out there. The US government kept such poor records regarding what was done and not done to protect employees that the US Department of Labor now has the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act started in 2001. So now that compensation employees who have illnesses related to exposure to radio radioactive and toxic substances. Unfortunately, that didn't happen in 1941 when radioactive iodine was released into the air. So it was way, way later. This is a piece I made about my father. My father was assistant manager for nuclear operations at Hanford during the 80s. He worked for the Department of Energy for 21 years. <laughs> he was never able to talk about his work and rarely was I able to visit his office. Part of his job was to decide <laughs> which documents should be declassified or not. Many of the papers he remembers keeping classified were likely evidence of the nuclear testing events that led to his own father's stomach and thyroid cancer. My mother came out to Richland, the closest town to Hanford, when she was a toddler. My mother had two full mastectomies soon after she turned 50, and because she was living in Richland her whole life and worked out at Battelle Labs for many years, she too qualified for compensation of $150,000 for breast cancer. Wanda is a friend of the family. She became sick and qualified for compensation also. Plutonium-239 looks unnatural in its bright fluorescent green and poses a radioactive danger to anyone working with it or living in the region. Its effects are slow and silent. The line of green here represents the depth of damage that this chemical has caused by seeping into the ground, the water, and the people's bodies over the years. After the Hanford reactors were decommissioned at the end of the Cold War in 1990, 
years of weapons production left behind 53 million gallons of high level radioactive waste. The Hanford site contains to this day, two thirds of the United States radioactive waste. It's the largest environmental cleanup project in the world. I'm still working on this and have many more sculptures to build and ideas to create based on the various illnesses caused to the people in the area. This project has been really intense for me to work on and labor intensive conceptualizing and building the sculptures and telling the story of the area. What's next? I'm going to photo London in May, which is a big deal. And I have a discovery booth. I'll be showing without words and contaminated. So I got to make some new stuff contaminated. I'm also working on finishing a book on the Seattle music scene that I was in for more than 15 years documenting. So I'm going to give you a little taste of some of that. This is making it. Making It is a celluloid recording of the music scene in Seattle between 1993 and 2009, approximately. A story about the passion for creating in a time before smartphones and social media started running our lives. Immersion into the music scene. That's me, my friend Dawn. Your 20s, what a bunch of bullshit. I can't say I saw that I was in a special scene or that the end of an era of shooting film, but this was my life through my 20s and 30s. In the early 90s, the music scene blew up in Seattle and bands like Mud Honey, Nirvana, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden became the sound of a generation. Some people made it and others didn't, even though they may have deserved it, but everyone was in Seattle trying to make it. The influence of that moment impacted kids all over the world and especially, you know, in the surrounding um, area of outside of Washington State. And not long after everything blew up there, they arrived on the scene in Seattle to start a new wave of music and trying to make it. The industry changed a lot and bands like Built to Spill, Modest Mouse and Death Cab for Cutie emerged. For most of my time, I was building a commercial photography business while shooting portraits and live shows of bands and musicians on the side, mostly just shows that I enjoyed and people that were my friends. My clients started to become the weekly magazines, local rags, radio stations, and music festivals. Most of this Im imagery is from film. And it was only around 2008 and 2009 at the end that I started shooting digital. I loved shooting women musicians, styling, and really doing whatever the F I wanted to because it was the entertainment industry and they were open to anything and everything different. This series of documentary images celebrates a moment of progressive and alternative creativity that inspired generations of musicians, performers, and artists to create through passion, just like me. Thank you. That's it. Sorry, I tried to go through that a little fast. Well, thank you, Bootsy. That was fabulous. Okay. <laughs> Parched. You get a drink. <laughs> yeah. So, anybody have anything they'd like to throw out to Bootsy? Well, um, Bootsy, I, I've seen your, um, I think it was vintage photos where you, you've uh, inserted your, yourself into older photos. Yeah, visitor. Uh, yeah, visitor. Okay. <clears throat> um, that's really cool. Uh, the hard thing about that is uh, getting the the uh, the light and everything to work with the older films. How did you achieve that? <laughs> um, I often was watching the light outside and really <clears throat> trying to match possibly the time of year, the time of day, and literally watching light and being like okay i'm gonna have you know going outside looking at the light okay i'm gonna have to do it at this time there's only a few that i had to shoot a f with a flash and um 
you know, I just set it up so that my, the shadow on the wall would match, you know, the, the, the flash, but yeah, I mean, it was really researching light and trying to be as picky as I could about um, getting it right. Yeah, but you did a good job on it. I've always liked that, uh, that, that project. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> um, one, one, other, one other question. I noticed that a lot of them, in, unless you have, if, unless there is more to show, a lot of, it seems like a lot of your projects are small numbers of photos. No, I just, they're not. They're all okay. 25 or more pieces to each of them. I just knew I couldn't show them all because we wouldn't have enough time. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to see the whole series, you can go to my website and you'll see that there's, you know, usually about 20 to 25 pieces, some are more, you know, tre treasures is more, you know, Ruby and Willie is a 52 images, you know, so some of them are really big. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It was a great talk. <laughs> Thank I, you. Important artist. I really think that you're a very important artist and uh, I'm excited to see your work. I, I think it was an outstanding uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks. I was trying to, you know, paint a picture for you guys so you could really understand why I create. And if you kind of understand who I am, then, you know, you can kind of see why I created the work I did or why it all comes from emotion or, you know, that I was self-taught, you know. Dawn, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that was, I've known Bucci for a really long time. And I don't think I've ever heard one of her talks, but my gosh, it was so great. And I just wanted to tell her that I was, it was really cool to see everything just laid out like that because I do I remember all of that work so that was really cool so love yeah. you thank you Dawn Dawn Thanks. is from from the Tri-Cities I yeah. went to high school with her so she she understands the heavy background of everything that I was trying to share with everyone yeah so good work thank you. love you thank you I, I really want to congratulate you on your um your analysis of your life and um, <laughs> and your intent on really breaking it down and giving meaning to really small phases and large phases and and to people. I think that that in itself was um, I, I felt like this could have been biography, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to a photo talk, a, a book talk. But it it I really I really appreciated that. It's it's a lot of work to think about about your life, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it's with us, obviously, but but we but we can uh, just scoot right by it unless we pause and and uh, as I say, analyze it. So thank you for that. And um, your images are um, it's so interesting. I know that they're coming from a place of emotion, but they're very conceptual. Mm. You know, and for me, that means there's kind of a distance, you know, I'm analyzing it rather than feeling it. So um, it's, I think it, so that's an interesting thing. I, I, I don't think that makes a difference in the image impact, you know, it's just a different way of uh, absorbing it. Yeah, and I do feel like some people are it depends on who you are also. So I have people cry in front of my work. So they obviously are picking up something <laughs> different than you. So it depends on who you are and, yeah. and then what you take from it, right? So. Yeah, and I'm also kind of an analytical person. So, so I'm looking at, at the elements, you know, and I'm trying to figure out why you put them together and so forth. And but anyhow, I, I, a really interesting hour, wonderful hour, and, um, and really, uh, it's such a deliberate and evolving uh, journey you've been on, visual journey. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so, um, Lucy, I first became aware of your work when you presented actually at the Photo Center Northwest in Seattle with the postcard book and um, was really taken by it. And then you know, started to follow your work and, and understood, because I was at that talk also at PCW. Yeah. And I live in Seattle and have been here since um, 1990. So the whole music scene and your connection to it and your um, really, I think you did such an amazing job of capturing what that was at the time. And then your whole, ex I mean, everything about your work, I think is really powerful because it's so personal and um, it, it, it's so revealing of ideas. And given the situation at Hanford, the fact that your family was so deeply, deeply touched by that, that um, I found that work to be both really um, intelligent and um, heart-wrenching. And the idea of what you've done to really um, explore, embrace, and explain, because for people who don't live in this in the Northwest, mm -hmm. Hanford is a you know mysterious thing out there. Maybe nobody even knows about it. And um, I lived in Denver during all the Rocky Flats stuff. So between Rocky Flats and Hanford, it's part of our history that is so important for people to know. And you've done such an incredible job of exploring it and revealing it. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. It's great to see the trajectory of your work and um, all your exploration. And also on the other side of it, the technical um, mastery that you have. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Ellen. Anyone else? Well, I've got one more question. Uh, I notice that in a lot of your work, uh, you, you've developed a palette that seems to carry through each of your work. How 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 did you do that? I mean, you you had to decide on colors first of all. Did you create like in Photoshop uh, swatches that you might want to use, or do you just? No, 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 no. I mean, all that is is through the camera. There's okay. No, I mean. The without words is digital work, but really everything else is film. And, you know, the color palette is driven by the environment. And I rarely, I mean, maybe in my commercial work, but rarely in my artwork, do I ever go in and manipulate color unless I'm trying to get it to what I saw and it didn't quite uh, become what I was visually seeing at the moment I shot it. So I'm very, like if I'm shooting in tungsten light, I'm shooting in tungsten because I want tungsten and I let it be what it is. The color palette, like at my mom's house and my grandma's house, my grandma and grandpa's house, that that was their color palette and i tried to you know make sure i kept it and um you know the reality of what it was you know and then the the uh the declassified work outside you know i went for this bright blown out washed out look on purpose, you know, because that is what that place looks like. And so I wanted to convey that through the look of the imagery. So I shot in bright light and I, I wanted them to be a little washed out. Very good. Yeah, because that the color palette brings, really brings them all together as a, as a you know, as a body of work. Right. And because I'm self-taught, um, you know, I, I really just let the camera and the locations really push my look. And I try to stay real for the look. Um, you know, without words, the ones that were the sky is pink, the sky is pink because the sky was pink. Very good. You Thank know? you, that's great. Yeah. Bootsy, what's your website? bootsyholler.com 
<laughs> okay, good. Yeah, B O O T S Y H O L L E R. How'd yeah, you get, how'd you get a your lot of, yeah, my a lot of my old work that you that I showed you some of the really old stuff. You know, it's not on that website. <clears throat> and, how'd you and, get how'd you get your first name? Yeah, that's why I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my mother never called me my name and I hated the name she called me. And um, I often had nicknames. And so when I went to college, somebody started calling me Boots because they didn't know, they didn't know me, but they saw me on campus. And then later I picked it up and started using it. And uh, my junkie boyfriend started using it. And when I moved to Seattle, as soon as someone introduces you as a name, why would anybody call you anything different? So at some point I thought, you know, I'm an artist. I want to be a commercial photographer and having a different name um, is like a trademark. So I took it on and uh, made it a business. I wear boots a lot. I wore boots a lot. <laughs> Great. Okay, anybody else? If not, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming and holding out at the beginning while we sorted out our technical issues. Um, everything worked fine once we got going. Um, cool. Next month is, we'll see you on February 16th. And um, thanks everybody for coming and we'll see you then. Bootsy, thanks for a really great um, a presentation, um, and I got to know you a little bit better, which is great. Thank you. I worked hard on it. I've been revamping it all week. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad you guys enjoyed it because that's the first time I, I've, I've done that style of talk. So thank you so much. Thanks, all right. Great, great show, Michael. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Well, absolutely. All right. It's good bye -bye. to be back. All right.